Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today we'll be talking about the significance of that eternal city known as Jerusalem. Warm well, welcome to the program and uh, my guest today is my a good friend, hasn't been on the Middle East Report for a couple of years, uh, Robin Benson, who's now working for Shekinah Legacy. Robin, it's uh, great to have you back on the Middle East Report. It's been too long. You've spent uh, two years in the Holy Land uh, living and working in Jerusalem. You're back now in, uh, in England and uh, welcome back to the Middle East Report. We've missed you anyway. Well, I've missed the opportunity too, Simon, and it's great to see you again, and I really appreciate the invitation to come back on to the Middle East Report. Thank you. Pleasure. And uh, I know that uh, many of our viewers uh, get your regular updates, um, particularly uh, telling us about some of the struggles and some of the spiritual battles in, in, in Jerusalem, but can you uh, share with us um, what you've been doing for the last uh, two years, particularly working for, is it um, uh, Christian Friends of Israel in Jerusalem? Yes, um, I went out middle of May 2015 on an initial two-year commitment to work with CFI Jerusalem as a volunteer. I mean, I think I related probably the last time I was on the programme, just the process of how that came about. <clears throat> and I knew going out there that this was definitely God's next assignment. In fact, that was the word that God gave me. That sort of began the confirmation process before I eventually went out. So I went out and for most of the two years I was working in what the CFI Jerusalem calls the media team. So I was assisting the, the director of technology in the production of what eventually became weekly radio programs that are broadcast on a network in the States. And just assisting in any other way that you know, he deemed useful just in media work. So sometimes that would go, mean two, two of us might go out with a video camera and just gather stock footage around the city. The radio program itself uh, involved setting up interviews because it was a weekly, so you, you know, we had to set up a core interview with someone who had a, an area of expertise. And that can be right across the board from things to do with the scriptures through to modern technology, you know, this, the political situation in Israel, a real variety of speakers. And on a few occasions I actually did those interviews and then they were edited and put into the program. It involved you know, keeping up to date with what was going on in the Middle East and the wider world. Uh, there were two news spots that I was responsible for in each of those programs, roughly about a minute, a minute and a half. And over the first sort of few weeks, I thought, I don't want it, because so often when we talk about Israel and the Middle East, it can always sound negative because sadly there are bad things happen on a regular basis. So I, you know, I spoke with my boss about it and said, okay, can we make one new spot the not so good stuff, but the other new spot, the good stuff. And I had one or two sources that I could pull it from and do three items of good news from Israel. And I mean, there was not a, literally a week went by, but there wasn't some new medical or technological advancement that you could summarize and put into that new slot. And of course, there was always plenty of stuff happening in the negative side too, you know. So, it was, a, uh, as far as work was concerned, it was reasonably varied. At times a bit pressurized because like you, you've got to keep a reservoir of material ready for these weekly broadcasts. But then, you know, just living and working in Jerusalem, you know, as we were talking about on our way here to the studio, has its, has its moments because it is a it is a center of spiritual battle. And I think that's probably one of the lessons I've come back to the UK with a better, deeper understanding that it really is a day-to-day -day spiritual battlefield. And, and sort of woe betide you if you don't approach life 
from a believer's perspective in Jerusalem in particular from that perspective. So would you, would you say really that uh, your perspective has changed on Israel and Jerusalem having spent two years living out there? Um, aside from the kind of daily spiritual battle uh, yeah. that is Jerusalem and it's a fantastic city, it's either, yeah. either it's very peaceful or it's extremely intense and nothing yeah. pretty much in between. No. Um, but you know, what do you come away with um, from your time spent in Israel? I think one of the things I come away with is that it is the centre of the world. From the biblical perspective, you know, Ezekiel talks about it, God speaks about the fact that it's the center of the world. And, you know, from a spiritual perspective, for, for, as far as Judaism and Christianity are concerned, it, it's where all of the major events in our shared history have occurred. So, yes, coming back, it is the center of the world from God's perspective and everything else radiates out from that, from his perspective. Excellent. And uh, you're now with uh, Shekinah Legacy. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never heard of this ministry. So <clears throat> can you share with us and our viewers what Shekinah Legacy is and uh, the kind of mandate for this ministry? Right. Um, obviously, you know that I worked with CFI UK, Christian Friends of Israel UK, for 10 years. And early on in my time with them, I got to know a couple Neville and Valerie Smith, who uh, lived in New Haven. And in my spare time, I you know, got to know them, did various bits and pieces with them. Sometime probably around 2008, um, they had been involved in Israel-related ministry for a long time. Uh, established a, a ministry called the Shofar Foundation, which is since not led by someone else. But they had various sort of... Um, uh, arms going into different areas of ministry to do with Israel and the Jewish people. And so 2008, 2009, they decided to pull all of those together and form this charity called the Shekinah Legacy. Really created, you know, as the, you know, as the strap line says, to honor and repay a debt that we as Christians owe to the Jewish people. It's an unrepayable debt. But Shekinah in its own way has sought to at least do advance something in that way of repaying and recognizing what we as Christian believers owe to the Jewish people. And I would say its main thrust is humanitarian work. So it's involved uh, with a Jewish um, <coughs> organization here in the UK called Goods for Good, which ships out humanitarian aid. And then that goes to another Dutch Christian organization that ships humanitarian aid all over the world, but including Israel. So Shekinah will underwrite the shipment of a container load of humanitarian aid, which eventually ends up in Israel, and then we work with another organization in Israel called Israel Relief Aid, who will actually distribute it once it's arrived. But there's been involvement in Alia work and supporting that through contacts, particularly in Eastern Europe, supporting Holocaust survivors through that same contact in Eastern Europe. And um, while I was in Israel, she kind of supported me financially because I was there as a, you know, an unpaid volunteer. One of the other thrusts in the original creation of Shekinah was, again, to step into this area of trying to encourage Christians to explore the Jewish roots, the Hebraic roots, the biblical roots of our faith. And I would say probably in the eight or so years <clears throat> that Shekinah has been going, that that's maybe the area that's not had the most uh, work done in it. So part of my remit in coming in is to see if we can extend that part of the, the ministry of the organization. Sadly, Neville's wife passed away last year after you know, a battle with cancer. So he very wisely has brought some others in to help him in the running and I've just come alongside him now to help with the day-to-day -day running of the ministry and to seek to advance you know, what it's about. Fantastic, that's really good. So I look forward to having um, both of you uh, on the Middle East Report well, in I'm the near sure future would, talking about the this Shekinah yeah. legacy. So okay. fantastic work. And uh, today's programme, we are talking about Jerusalem, but let's have a reminder of uh, Jerusalem's incredible history. Uh, that spans over 3,000 years since King David established Jerusalem as his city that became God's city. <laughs> yeah. Jerusalem, a historical journey through archaeology and art. 
Jerusalem, a mosaic of different peoples, faiths, and nationalities. Nevertheless, despite this diversity, under the sovereignty of Israel, Jerusalem is a city that works. But has it always been this way? The first historical mention of Jerusalem is in the Bible, in the era of the patriarchs. King David declares Jerusalem as Israel's capital, known from that point on also as Zion. His son, King Solomon, builds the first temple. But the temple is destroyed by the Babylonians, and the Jews are exiled. King Cyrus's declaration enables the Jews to return and rebuild the temple. Alexander the Great's conquests include Jerusalem. However, his successors desecrate the temple. Which leads to the Maccabees' revolt against the Greeks' imposition of Hellenism. The Roman Empire seizes control and King Herod renovates the temple. A large-scale revolt against a corrupt and vicious Roman reign fails. The second temple is destroyed and the Jews are banned from Jerusalem. Sixty years pass and Bar Kokhba leads another revolt for the freedom of Jerusalem. But it fails after three years of battle. Jews are banned from the city renamed by the Romans Aelia Capitolina in order to eradicate its Jewish heritage. Roman Emperor Constantine converts to Christianity and reinforces the ban on Jews entering Jerusalem. A new religion, Islam, sweeps through the Middle East. Non-Muslims are declared second-class citizens. Crusaders conquer Jerusalem in a bloodbath of Jews and Muslims. 2,000 Jews are burned alive in the main synagogue and the city is depopulated of its previous inhabitants. The first organized mass Jewish return arrives from France and England. The Mamluks defeat the Christian kingdom of Jerusalem and building and renovating of synagogues and churches is banned. The great Mishnai commentator Rabbi Ovadia of Bartanura settles in Jerusalem. The Ottoman Empire takes over, imposing restrictions on Jews and Christians, and Sultan Suleiman rebuilds the walls. But as the empire declines, Jerusalem is badly neglected. Still, the Jewish people stream back, build new neighborhoods, and re-establish their majority by 1863. World War I breaks out. The Ottoman Empire collapses and makes room for a new Middle East. The British Foreign Secretary, Arthur James Balfour, declares the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people. Britain receives a mandate to create a Jewish homeland, but forbids Jews from blowing the shofar or reading holy scrolls at the Western Wall. Thousands of Muslims are incited to unleash an attack against Jews in Jerusalem and Hebron. 86 Jews are brutally murdered, hundreds are wounded. UN Resolution 181 declares Jerusalem as a corpus separatum, a separate entity. A Jewish state is declared as Jerusalem is put under siege, conquered and divided. 58 synagogues are destroyed or desecrated. Harsh limitations are imposed on Jews and Christians for 19 years. The Six-Day War, Jerusalem is reunited and freedom and equality are restored. Throughout history, only Israel has protected the freedom of all peoples and faiths in Jerusalem.
incredible history uh, Jerusalem has. And uh, that was a fantastic overview of all the empires that have come and go. Uh, but we know that uh, Jerusalem is back under Jewish sovereignty. Um, <coughs> I have to uh, say, Robin, that this year is such a special year uh, for the city of Jerusalem in particular. I mean, not only is it the uh, 50th anniversary of the liberation and unification of Jerusalem um, in the aftermath of the Six Day War, but it's also the approaching the 100th anniversary in December when uh, General Allenby and the British and Anzacs forces liberated the Holy Land from the Ottoman Turks. Um, I mean, it just shows that really Jerusalem is at the epicenter yeah. of, uh, of world events. Yeah. Um, why do you think this city is so special? Why do you think there is such a battle for it? Well, from our perspective as Christians, you know, the word of God is clear. It is not just Israel's capital city. It's not just the Jewish people's center of their um, worship, their religious activity. From God's perspective, he calls it his city. The scriptures are clear. I, I mean, I find it sometimes really hard when people don't you know, read their Bibles and can't grasp that very simple but straightforward fact that God, you know, has said, it's mine, it's my, it's the, you know, my throne, it's the place where the Messiah will reign from, you know, when he returns. God's attention is on this city day and night. And, and therefore, because of that, the enemy of God will do all that he can to thwart what God has planned. Now, God is sovereign, and in the end, he will have his way. But nevertheless, the enemy will throw, you know, as they say, the kitchen sink at this battle to prevent Messiah returning, to prevent the Jewish people from maintaining their hold on the city of Jerusalem as their capital city. So you can understand in many respects why there is this diplomatic, political, and even religious battle going on for rights in this city, whose it belongs to, who owns it, who has control over it. And when you put that all into the melting pot, you have a place, as you said earlier, where it's either very quiet or totally tense, and there's very little middle ground between the two. And often, you know, it's in the more stressful end because it's constantly being brought back into our news by this battle that's going on behind the scenes that we understand, but that many people only see it through the eyes of politicians and diplomats and, and um, you know, army you know, forces that are at, sort of at loggerheads over control. Um, my is, <coughs> uh, Robin, it's extraordinary to think that, uh, for example, Jerusalem, uh, which has that over 3,000 year connection uh, with the Jewish people, and they've only considered Jerusalem as their capital city um, throughout uh, the diaspora mm -hmm. until the Jewish people started to go back in mass numbers in the early uh, 80, uh, late 1880s. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but for example, why is it that uh, virtually no country in the Western world actually recognizes Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem when we know the biblical connections, their co Jewish culture and Judaism's whole focus is Jerusalem? Uh, and yet the world would deny the Jewish people their rights and their claims to their ancient covenant city that is Jerusalem. I think there are different facets to that, um, you know, answers to that. I mean, part of it is that our Western culture based on Judeo-Christian values has ceased to be so. So the Bible no longer has a place of prominence in most Western nations or Westernized nations. So the authority and the legitimacy of the word of God is just completely ignored. You know, for the most part, politicians and diplomats think, so, so what? What has that got to do with day-to-day -day reality? Um, I think looking back over the history, certainly as far as the UK is concerned, um, there is the whole issue of the pressure of the Arab oil producing nations. And that was true of many of the other countries that pulled their embassies out of Israel and moved, out of Jerusalem and moved them to Tel Aviv. The, you know, the, the Saudis and the rest threatened to turn off the oil valve. 
Um, so you've got, you've got economics, you've got politics, you've got diplomacy in the background adding pressure to it. And it is just, the two things have become, the, the, the loss of a biblical perspective has become interwoven with this economic diplomatic pressure. And I think in the end, from a spiritual perspective, we're living in a time when people are, are yeah, I would go so strong as to say demonically deluded into believing the lies that have been told about Jerusalem and Israel and Jewish people. And in the end, it's not rational. From a human perspective, the behavior of Western nations is not rational. And if it's not rational, then you have to take a step back from it and say, okay, what's driving this? And it's spiritual forces that are deluding and deceiving people into, into believing multiple lies that if you sat down and looked, as thankfully some people do, they suddenly realize this is a load of nonsense. But until that, literally that veil is taken away, people will just, you know, merrily in inverted commas, go on down this track of trying to force Israel into dividing the land, handing over the heartland of Israel, and handing over half of the city, which if you, like you and I have been to the city, and then I did a, with some friends, did an afternoon tour with a guy who actually points out some of the facts on the ground. It will be literally physically impossible to divide Jerusalem. Absolutely. Because you walk, you drive down some roads, you've got Arabs on one side of the street, and Jews, Jewish people, Israelis on the other side of the street. How do you divide a city that, where people live, you know, cheek by jowl from the, from the two main ethnic groups? It's impossible. And yet that is what the nations of the world are constantly trying to pressurise Israel into doing. Uh, let's have a look now at the uh, Jewish ties to uh, their eternal city, Jerusalem, over 3,000 years. Would somebody dare saying that La Mecca is not connected to the Muslim and that Rome is not connected to Christianity, nobody would dare that. But the UNESCO went down to the lowest point of his history by denying that Jerusalem is connected to the Jewish people. It's a ridiculous, disgusting lie. The UN resolution is shameful. Simply put, it erases three millennia of archaeological, historical and religious documentation which is backed by history and archaeology in Jewish, Christian, and even Muslim sources. Jerusalem is mentioned more than 800 times in the Bible. As the capital of the Kingdom of Israel, it became the central symbol of the Jewish people. Despite hardships and decrees during the Jewish exile, Jews continued to live and worship in Jerusalem. Those who were exiled and longed to return have proclaimed next year in Jerusalem. And the word Zion, Zion, one of Jerusalem's many names, is the root of Zionism, the national return of the Jewish people to their ancient homeland. Following the War of Independence, the city was divided and parts of it were occupied by Jordan. The Jordanians barred Jews from entering Jewish holy places. Dozens of synagogues were desecrated, burned and blown up. 38,000 Jewish gravestones on the Mount of Olives were vandalized. The dividing line was filled with barriers and Jordanian snipers fired at civilians. But the belief that one day Jews would be able to return to unify Jerusalem had not disappeared. With the unification of the city, the level of security for everyone increased. Until 67, it was only a dream to see together Jewish, Christians, Muslim in the malls, in the university, in the school, in the streets, and also in the Knesset. People of integrity, truth, and goodwill must combat these vicious and mendacious Palestinian claims. The fight for the truth of Jerusalem is essential to guarantee the future of the holy city, to protect its holy sites, and ensure freedom of worship for all faiths, for Jews, Christians, and Muslim residents. Jerusalem's connection to the Jewish people, not only as the capital, but as the collective heart and soul that unites Jews throughout the world, must be protected today, tomorrow, and forever.
Absolutely, yeah. An incredible uh, city, uh, Yerushalayim, uh, city of gold, and uh, it's a very special place, and it's something that, uh, as Christians, all of us uh, should fight for. And there is a battle, isn't there, for uh, Jerusalem, and we see that uh, the international community, uh, you know, the UN, um, the EU, or even the uh, British Foreign Office consider that uh, Jerusalem should be divided between so-called uh, Jewish West Jerusalem and Arab East Jerusalem and the Arab East Jerusalem, including mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the old city, uh, which would include the uh, Western Wall and the Temple Mount, should be in Palestinian hands. Mm -hmm. And to back that up, we've uh, last year in the dying days of the um, Obama administration, we saw uh, the US administration supporting um, UNESCO and imposing UN Resolution 2334 on Israel that does not recognize any Jewish rights or claims uh, to the ancient city in Jerusalem. It's almost as if the world is opposed to Israelis living, working in Jerusalem. I don't think it's almost, I think it is. I mean, there are the odd little nation, sadly, they are small nations. Um, that voted against that resolution in, in UNESCO. Uh, but the nations of the world are against... The nations of the world are against the God of Israel. Yeah. And therefore they are against anything that Israel and the Jewish people living in the land of Israel do to assert their legitimate historical rights to the, all of the land and to the city of Jerusalem. I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple. But for organizations like UNESCO to pass the resolutions that they did, it flies in the face, okay, from our perspective, it flies in the face of the Bible, but from a historical perspective, from an archeological perspective, it flies in the face of, of fines and data and documents. So I, again, you have to take a step back and think, how on earth did it come to a point that an organization like UNESCO flies in the face, denies historical documentation and you know, factual evidence on the ground. And you know, I, sorry if it sounds like a broken record, but you come back to the point, this is a spiritual battle and there's an enemy deluding the nations of the world into creating a situation where they will seek, not just from a diplomatic, but maybe from a much stronger point of view, to force Israel to go down this route of dividing the city. And you can't do it. Not, you can't do it peacefully, that is for sure. And you cannot give away to a Arab Muslim government is Jewish people's most holy sites and some of the Christian sites as well. What we as Bible-believing Christians forget is that by UNESCO, passing that motion, it denies our history as well. Absolutely. Because all of the key moments in the life of Yeshua, of Jesus, happened in that part of the city. So if you give it away to a, a, an Arab state that is avowedly, you know, fundamentalist Muslim, you are going to take a step back to what it was like when Jordan had control and much of what Israel has done to improve access for all faiths to those parts of the old city will be lost. There'll be desecration, there'll be destruction. It, it, it just, it's, but it's, it is beyond belief. But Robin, shouldn't, shouldn't the Western world be angry? Um, I mean, it's one thing to attack the Jewish people, to attack their, their claims to Jerusalem, and then to deny any legitimate sovereignty or connection to their ancient eternal city that they've held in their hearts uh, since David established Jerusalem as the center of his kingdom, um, that Jerusalem has always symbolically been connected to the Jewish people. So you can imagine the complete and utter outrage there was last November when UNESCO decided to pass this motion denying any connection toward to Jewish connection to the Temple Mount and the Western Wall, including the Old City renaming the uh, the Temple Mount, um, the, uh, the Al-Sharif, uh, mm -hmm. what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and yet there was no outrage uh, from uh, the Western world. But this also represents a fundamental attack on our Judeo-Christian heritage. So why weren't Western nations uh, who have their heritage um, 
as part of our Judeo-Christian society in the Western world that is the foundations of Western civilization. Why weren't these nations in outrage that this is an attack on their nations as well as the attack on the Jewish people and the nation of Israel? I think part of it is that they, they are, are Judeo-Christian and it's a very thin, like, foil layer over the, the top of our society. And underneath, we are a secular and in many respects, anti-God, anti-God of the Bible society. Yes, there was outrage on the part of individuals, some churches, you know, some politicians spoke out against it, but on the whole, there's a veneer of Judeo-Christian uh, uh, symbolism over the top of our society, but underneath, it, nothing is, there's hardly anything supporting it. So it, 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 in some senses, it is no wonder that it got through the way that it does. Plus the fact that many of these UN organizations, we have to face the reality that they are heavily weighted by those who are anti-Israel. You know, mainly Islamic nations, but not totally. You know, they're the ones who hold the majority when it comes to these votes. And uh, westernized nations can speak up and speak out, but when it comes to the vote, they are outvoted. It happens at the UN, it happens in UNESCO on a regular basis. Let's have a look now at uh, the uh, shocking uh, UNESCO vote uh, on Jerusalem that occurred in the autumn of last year. As the nation of Israel shut down and the Jewish people all over the world fasted and prayed on the holiest day in the Jewish calendar, known as Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation were preparing to vote on a resolution entitled Occupied Palestine that would reclassify the Temple Mount and the Western Wall by their Muslim names and thus deny Jewish and Christian connections to the sacred holy sites in Jerusalem. This UNESCO vote does not only deny any Jewish historical connection to the most sacred sites in Judaism, but also represents a fundamental assault on our Judeo-Christian heritage. This is the latest example of anti-Israel bias in the United Nations, where Israel's enemies are waging a diplomatic war against the Jewish state. This is a battle for the control of the Temple Mount and is at the epicenter of a battle of civilizations that we are witnessing today in our struggle against Islamic extremism. The Temple Mount is the biblical site where Abraham was preparing to sacrifice his son Isaac. King Solomon built the first temple where the Holy of Holies contained the Ark of the Covenant which God's presence resided in. The Temple Mount was also where Jesus overturned the money changers and therefore is part of our biblical heritage. This UNESCO vote on Jerusalem is also undermining the international organization's credibility as it's been hijacked by Islamic countries, seeking to delegitimize and attack the only Jewish state in the world. Jerusalem, only under Israeli sovereignty, have these holy sites that are sacred to Jews, Christians and Muslims being protected. And now this UNESCO vote threatens religious freedom in this ancient city. On Thursday the 13th of October 2006, UNESCO members voted in favour of the draft resolution entitled Occupied Palestine by 24 votes to 6. Britain, the United States and Germany voted against this motion despite the fact that other European nations like France, Greece, Spain, Sweden, Slovenia and Ukraine abstained giving victory to several Arab nations sponsoring the motion. The text of the draft refers to the Temple Mount as the Harim al-Sharif or the Noble Sanctuary that includes the Alaska Mosque and the Western Wall as the Muslim site of al Bukra Plaza. It is considered the third most holiest site in Islam after Mecca and Medina and Saudi Arabia. The Western Wall is the most sacred site in Judaism as it's the retaining wall of the Second Temple. It was in the Six Day War in June 1967 that East Jerusalem controlled by Jordan was liberated by Israel in that defensive war and Jerusalem's holy sites were back in the hands of Israeli sovereignty. Israel's defense minister at the time, Mushi Dayan, gave back the control of the Temple Mount to Jordan to prevent an Islamic war against Israel. Since June 1967, Israel has provided religious access to all the holy sites in Jerusalem, despite the fact that on many occasions, Jewish people are prevented from going up to the Temple Mount to pray. The Israeli Prime Minister, 
Benjamin Netanyahu responded quickly to the UNESCO resolution by suspending Israel's membership to the international organization and made this statement. The UNESCO theater of the absurd continues. Today, that organization adopted another delusional decision that states that the Jewish people have no connection to the Temple Mount or the Western Wall. To say that Israel has no connection to the Temple Mount is like saying that China has no connection to the Great Wall of China or that Egypt has no connection to the pyramids. With this absurd decision, UNESCO has lost the modicum of legitimacy it had left. Even UNESCO's Director General, Irina Barkova, was shocked by the motion by giving this statement and saying, to deny, conceal or erase any of the Jewish, Christian or Muslim traditions undermines the integrity of the site and runs counter to the reasons that justify its inscription on the UNESCO World Heritage List. When these divisions carry over into UNESCO, an organisation dedicated to dialogue and peace, they prevent us from carrying out our mission. The Palestinian Authority and the Islamist terrorist organisation Hamas expressed delight in the resolution by welcoming it and a spokesman for Hamas called it a step in the right direction. The UNESCO vote represents another battle over Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. As back in the summer of 2014, after Israel's war against the Islamist terrorist organization Hamas in Gaza, after it launched rockets and missiles into Israel, Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood responded by launching a wave of knife attacks and also attempted to start a violent confrontation on the Temple Mount against Israeli security forces in an attempt to ignite an Islamic holy war against Israel. Palestinian militants launched fireworks from the Alaska Mosque and were baiting the Israeli police to storm the mosque in order to ignite Muslim public opinion around the world against Israel with the usual false claims that Alaska Mosque is under threat. This footage shows that these Palestinian militants do not care about the so-called sacredness of the Alaska Mosque as if they were prepared to set it on fire in order to create a conflict with Israel. The Muslim Brotherhood have also made claims to Jerusalem and have declared it as their intention to have it as the capital of the Islamic Caliphate and they believe that if they can capture Jerusalem then they can defeat the West. Therefore, this UNESCO vote represents a diplomatic war against Israel that ultimately threatens the very security and freedoms of the Western world. In conclusion, the European nations that abstained on the UNESCO vote should be ashamed because they are denying their own cultural heritage and history and empowering the Arab nations to rewrite history and undermine the important work of UNESCO for an ugly political agenda. The United Nations should be promoting religious freedom and liberty, not destroying it, and by denying the Jewish people their biblical and cultural heritage is shocking as it is shameful. The United Nations and UNESCO need urgent reform Otherwise, these international organisations that have no moral authority or clarity will go the way of its predecessor, the League of Nations, into obscurity. The leaders of the United Nations would do well to read the Bible, especially Zechariah chapters 12, 2 to 4. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples. When they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall happen on that day I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. No empire, nation or individual who has come against God's plan and destiny for Jerusalem has survived, and UNESCO would do well to heed this biblical warning. We need to make a stand against this revisionist history that denies a biblical connection between the Jewish people and Jerusalem because if we do not confront it, then we are denying our own history and also putting our own future in jeopardy. Just it goes to show that there is uh, an incredible battle uh, being waged for the ownership and control of Jerusalem and particular the Temple Mount um, as that UNESCO vote occurred. Uh, last October, that's October 2016. Um, 
Robin, I really want to go on and talk about the kind of Muslim Brotherhood because it's so interesting, isn't it, when we see the kind of dynamics of Islamic extremism um, that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in particular want to capture Jerusalem and they want Jerusalem to be the capital of the, of the Islamic Caliphate uh, that they're trying to introduce, mm. not, not Cairo, mm. Not uh, Mecca, not Medina, mm -hmm. not Riyadh, uh, not Syria, but they want Jerusalem. Uh, is it because they feel that if they get uh, Jerusalem, then they've won the West? I think possibly. I think, too, obviously you have to step back and realise the point that Islam first invaded uh, the Holy Land. Therefore, from that point onwards, as any other territory that they have taken, they view it as theirs. Any loss of territory is a slap in the face. You know, I know, the whole thing of shame and honour are major issues in the Middle East. So it's a, it is a centuries worth of shame, uh, particularly the last 100 years post uh, you know, Balfour Declaration and Allenby, so on, capturing the city. Uh, so, you know, the, the Muslim world has lived with this 100 years of shame. So anything that they can do to reclaim their honour is number one. Number two, it's a poke in the eye to the Jewish people and to the Christian faith. It's probably seen as the two main contenders in the religious world when it, co when it comes to Islam. Uh, and three, it is just... Uh, a reassertion or, uh, of their sovereignty over something that they view as theirs. And I know that's connected with the first, but it, it's, it's slightly different because it's a reassertion that will, if it should, God forbid, but if it should ever happen, would be a catastrophe for both the Christian faith and for Judaism. Because, key, as we said before, key religious sites that both of our shared history hold dear would be lost to us. And, I mean, we, I, you know, we don't hear that much about the Muslim Brotherhood at the minute. Everything is IS or ISIL or ISIS or whatever you know, expression you want to use for it. Whether the Muslim Brotherhood have yet to come back into their own and to force this issue, we, we shall see. Um, but, you know, Jerusalem is a center of conflict. It doesn't really matter who's egging on the conflict. It is a center of conflict. One person drops off the picture, someone else will take their place. And in the end, from a biblical perspective, the whole push of the enemy is to stop the Messiah returning to the holy city, period. That's what it's all about. From God's perspective, from a biblical perspective, from our perspective, the Messiah is coming back. So the enemy of God will use whatever means he can, whether it's the Muslim Brotherhood or the UN or the EU, whoever. He will use his tools in each of those different organizations in order to thwart that possibility. And the United States under uh, President uh, Donald Trump have the opportunity, don't they, to uh, align American foreign policy with God's foreign policy. Yes. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, um, you know, there's that opportunity there to move the US Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, I know that that would probably instigate uh, Arab riots across the Middle East against American embassies and there would be uh, a political uproar for a short time. But it would also then signify that the world's greatest power, uh, the world's only remaining superpower, recognises Jewish sovereignty in that ancient, eternal city of Jerusalem. What kind of message would that send out to the world? And what kind of message would that send to the enemies of Israel? Well, I mean, I was still living in Jerusalem when Donald Trump was voted in. And I mean, looking back on his statements and the election campaigning, there was a great upsurge of hope that this thing would get sorted. But of course, as time has dragged on, we've had statements from Mike Pence, we've had statements from President Trump, We've had statements from Ambassador Friedman when he eventually arrived that, you know, that this is going to happen. And I think, honestly, everybody's in, okay, we will wait and see. But if it does happen, you know, loads of us, many of us long for it to happen for the very reasons that you stated, because it would be a stamp of approval, finally, 
that Israel as a legitimate nation state has a legitimate capital. But as you say, if Donald Trump manages to actually do it, uh, I dread to think, yes, what will happen? I remember talking to someone in Jerusalem about this and they pointed out, not far from where I lived, I lived in East, East Talpiot area, there is the American consulate. I used to pass the road off to it on my way into work every day in the bus. No, very well. And someone pointed out that when that was built, uh, this was a, I mean, this, this was an Israeli citizen, said when that was built, it was built actually with the possible intention of turning it into the American embassy. And all it would really do would need to be, would be to change the nameplate out on the front gate. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, because the, Again, on the bus route in, we used to pass two pieces of barren land. Apparently, and I, I asked around, and as far as I know, this is true, one side of the road is set aside for the Ameri new American embassy, and the other side of the road is set aside for the new British embassy. They're just barren tracts of land on a major route into the city. Again, if it ever happens, we shall see. But as you say, it is a potential flashpoint because the Arab nations will not take that sitting down. They will kick up a stink. And when we're talking about Jerusalem, I think we have to also recognize the fact that only under Israeli sovereignty have exactly. access to yes. all the uh, religious sites being yes. protected. Uh, you know, whether you are Jewish, whether you are Christian, whether you are Muslim, yes. you have freedom of worship yeah. in Jerusalem that hasn't happened under any other form of control. Yes. And it's actually, uh, uh, thinking about it as well, the Jewish people themselves are more keen to promote other people's freedoms that they don't force their own demand to actually have that um, ability to go up onto the Temple Mount, which is the most holiest site in Judaism, uh, near the Holy of Holies, uh, and to actually go up on the Temple Mount and pray, mm -hmm. fearing a uh, kind of Arab Backlash. I mean, we saw what happened uh, only a couple of months ago when Israeli soldiers, um, guards were shot mm -hmm. and they imposed um, those metal detectors on Muslim mm -hmm. worshippers up on the Temple Mount to make sure there was no violence up there. Yes. So we know how much it, it is a flashpoint and we know that uh, the Palestinian Authority, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas want to use the Temple Mount as a flashpoint mm -hmm. in order to stir up Muslim public opinion around the world yes. in a jihad mm -hmm. against Jerusalem yeah. and against Israel. Yeah. I mean, our, our politicians and our diplomats have got short memories or they are historically ignorant and they do not either know or they do not remember what it was like when Jordan had control over that part of the city from 49 through to 67. As the, you know, the, the, the clips that we have shown portrayed, Jewish sites were vandalized, they were desecrated. The same thing will happen again if East Jerusalem is given back into the hands of Islam. Whatever form of Islam it is, the same thing will happen again. And I cannot see, there's, there's no Israeli government, it doesn't matter what political shade of opinion it is, is going to do that. Not willingly anyway. Uh, Robin, we've got a minute and a half uh, left of the program. Mm. Um, I have to ask you really, as uh, Christians, what should our role be to protect the sacred and holy city of Jerusalem? Okay, the scripture, the, uh, the Psalms, Psalm 122, says that we should pray for the shalom, the peace of Jerusalem. That's a, an order, that's a mandate. But we need, more, need to do more than that. We need to be informed as to what is going on in the Middle East from good, reliable news sources. And we need to be willing to regularly badger our political representatives not to forget this issue, not to shelve it, but to keep it in mind and that any opportunity comes up to put it back into the public domain, that they take a proper stance, a, a historical, archaeological, and even if they're Christians, a biblical stance on the rights to the Jewish people to have their eternal city as their capital. Excellent. Because, uh, Robin, I, I just feel that uh, Jerusalem uh, is not only an incredibly special place to actually visit, but also we know that this is the centre of God's future government. This mm -hmm. is when the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, is going to return to the Mount of Olives. So we know that it's, uh, it really does set the stage uh, for, the, uh, for the end times, but also we know that only 
with Jewish hands and only under Jewish sovereignty can these sites be protected. I just want to thank you so much for being my guest back on the Middle East uh, Report. Robin, it's great to have you back uh, and thank you for a great programme. Simon, it's been great to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Pleasure. And uh, I just want to thank you all for watching today's Middle East Report. As we've seen in this programme, there is a battle going on for the heart and the control of Jerusalem. That's why we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and we need to stand with Israel and the Jewish people in, in actually proclaiming that Jerusalem is God's city. So we leave you with this fantastic song that celebrates the beauty of Jerusalem. Shalom.